Oh, hey, how are you? Okay, great. Well, I'm here to do you a little tour. I'm on the East River here, gonna be doing a tour today of uh, Spanish Harlem slash East Harlem. Gonna be pretty good. Uh, Pat, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks. How are you? I'm, I'm good, thank you so much for asking. Uh, very selfless of you. Well, we're gonna be learning a lot today, Pat. Uh, I guess before we start, guys, check out the Patreon. That's how I fund these things. That's what keeps the lights on, keeps the sunscreen on my face. Also, like and subscribe, that's a huge help uh, as well. But uh, yeah, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna bore you. Tons of cool history here. We're gonna try to cover it. I obviously can't cover all of it. So relax before you start getting your typing fingers ready to tell me what I missed. We're just trying a little overview, a little survey, some cool stories. And I'm gonna give you that for sure. So before I keep rambling myself here in the outer space, let's keep it moving. You ready to do this, Pat? Yes, sir. Let's go. All right, so I'm starting out here on 116th, one of the main drags here is Spanish Harlem. And uh, I'm gonna start at the beginning here. So this whole area of North Manhattan was actually Native Americans early on, obviously before the Dutch got here. The Lenape, remember, under the Algonquin Nation, uh, they inhabited these areas. They actually used this East River for fishing. And we're not talking about fishing where you sit there with a line in the water and pretend to have fun with your friends. We're talking about like subsistence fishing. They, this is what they used to actually provide meals and stuff, right? So this area is actually settled by Dutch and then English farmers and, you know, basically property owners. We talked about some of these properties in the Midtown East, uh, also the Upper East Side. You had these farms basically out in this area. And it wasn't until like the mid 1800s, late 1800s that uh, people started to feel more connected. You had the elevated railways kind of making their way up uh, in the 1870s, 1880s. Uh, and then the turn of the century, you had immigrant groups kind of start making their home here. Initially, the Irish were here. Uh, we've talked about Irish in, you know, the Five Points. That's where they made their home. Uh, you know, the potato famine, mid-1800s, brought a lot of Irish over here. You also had Jewish immigration here. Now, the big wave of Jewish immigration came starting in 1881 all the way until the 1920s. They settled in Lower East Side specifically, uh, but also up here. In fact, Harlem was the largest, uh, largest neighborhood of Jews aside from uh, the Lower East Side, which is saying a lot. You also had, on top of all that, German. The German came up here. The German came up here from the East Village, for example, after the General Slocum disaster. Hello. Talk about this in a million videos as well. Uh, long story short, the General Slocum sinks in the East River, uh, basically killing uh, over 1,100 women and children, German women and children, who were on their picnic outing for the year. Insane. And people were watching, you know, women dive into the water and drown and babies and in defective life vests, you know, sinking into the water is a total nightmare. I know that's all very sad, so uh, here's a picture of my cat. Uh, anyways, those are the immigrant groups that came, but the big, the first major immigrant group to settle here in East Harlem slash what today is Spanish Harlem is the Italians, believe it or not. The Italians kind of moved on up to this area from what was then Little Italy down uh, lower Manhattan. Uh, and I'm actually standing in front of Our Lady of Mount Carmel which to this day still holds the Feast of the Giglio. I've talked about this in a video as well because they do one in Williamsburg, uh, also Our Lady Mount Carmel out there, but they have one here as well where they take this giant, like all these dudes kind of stand around, they take this giant, you know, shrine with a Virgin Mary on top and there's people playing horns and instruments and all kinds of stuff on top of this thing. It kind of sounds, I mean, just watching this video makes my discs get herniated, but there were so many Italians that you had different streets dedicated to different parts of Italy. So 107 was Naples, uh, 100 was the uh, Sicilians, you had 109 was uh, Calabrians, people from all over. Now remember, the Italians came over here in the late 1800s because Italy wasn't a united country completely until the 1870s. These were all different regions. People think a Roman Empire, they're like, oh, that thing's been around forever. Well, it hasn't. In fact, the United States, as we know it, is pretty much an older country than the country you, that we know today as Italy. But with this, especially in the South, there were problems, you know, lots of uh, poverty and lack of jobs, so people came over here. Uh, and, you know, it was around that time that Little Italy started to form in Lower Manhattan. Then they moved on up to parts like this. Uh, so you had all these different immigrant groups. Like I said, the Irish were the initial group, but they were mostly on the western side of the island here in this Harlem area. I mean, back then, though, you couldn't, you couldn't throw a freaking Blarney Stone without hitting Irish, but they were up here too as well. So, you know, kind of cool how all these different immigrant groups kind of came through just this neighborhood. Now, this would change. 
and we're gonna talk about that. Obvi. Okay, so I was talking about the Italians that were here. Well, there was a period of transition here in post-World War II where they were replaced by a different group. Uh, today, this is known as Spanish Harlem because of the Puerto Ricans who came here. Now, a little background, Puerto Rico was actually acquired by the United States after the Spanish-American War of 1898. Then in 1917, the Jones Act was passed, basically making them citizens of the United States. Uh, then in 1952, was created as a commonwealth of the United States, although it's not technically a commonwealth, it's a whole thing. So Operation Bootstrap was passed post-World War II to try to industrialize the uh, island. Yeah, it was called Operation Bootstrap. It's, you know, you might as well have called it Operation Get Your shit Together. But uh, yeah, it was pretty harsh, and it basically was to industrialize the island, got rid of a lot of the farming and subsistence farming. A lot of those farmers and things went into the cities, and there was a huge labor surplus, not enough jobs, so a lot of them came here. That was actually part of, uh, factored in to that operation. So from 1947 to 1970, a third of Puerto Rico, the island, left to come to places like New York City. That's a lot of people. Hundreds of that, there's actually more people on mainland United States than there is in the island of Puerto Rico today. And they came to New York City at a time when jobs were scarce, especially manufacturing jobs. Manufacturing was leaving the cities uh, post-World War II for cheaper land outside of the cities. Highways were developed, you had white flight, etc. Manufacturing jobs were disappearing from New York. So from 1950 to 1980, 500,000 manufacturing jobs disappeared. So there was no jobs, no jobs for the labor that came over. We're gonna talk about that in a second, but what's important to remember is that Puerto Ricans don't have their own country. It's tied to culture. It's tied to things like the flag. You see the flag a lot because it was actually illegal. In 1948, the flag was made illegal because it was, it was tied to the independence movements in Puerto Rico that was led by a lot of the labor and the farmers and people who were out of work. So you see that a lot here. I'm actually in front of a place called La Marqueta, which I bet you can't guess what that is. It's a market. It's actually in a place that was called the Park Avenue Retail Market that was created by Fiorella LaGuardia. Uh, now, Fiora LaGuardia actually outlawed uh, food like push carts and things like that, and to replace them, created these types of markets. There's actually a few of them. There's the Essex Market down Lower, Lower East Side. He created one on Arthur Avenue, all over to kind of replace that. It was the hygiene problems and all those kinds of things. So the actual Puerto Ricans here in New York were known as New Yorican by the people back at home. It was kind of a derogatory term, but it was actually adopted by the Puerto Ricans here as like a sign of pride. It's like not. Puerto Rican, not American, it's New Yorican. Pretty cool. Uh, so you have things like the New Yorican Poets Cafe down in, uh, down in East Village, and you have this kind of embrace of the area and of the, the culture. So 116th is actually right here as well, and that's kind of the main drag of Spanish Harlem. That's where, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, you would hear, you know, Tito Puente blaring from the windows. You know who that is, right, Pat? Yes, sir. He's the guy who sings, uh, Oye como va, mi ritmo bueno pa goza, mulata. You know, that was pretty good. Now keep in mind, Puerto Rico is a colony today. It was very much exposed in 2017 when Hurricane Maria hit, and uh, you know it was actually left to kind of, you know, suffer because of it. And also in 2014, the debt crisis that hit Puerto Rico, all this kind of exposed this relationship with the United States, where the United States kind of left it hung out, to, hung it out to dry, uh, unlike the way it would have treated, let's say, a state who would have who would have uh, suffered a similar disaster. So. It's an it's a interesting and ongoing saga. We'll see where it all ends. So 116th, which is right here, a really you know, nice thoroughfare, a lot of life and energy. That's where you go today to hear, you know, you're not gonna hear uh, Tito Puente as much, but you might hear, you know, Mark, Mark Anthony. You know who Mark Anthony is, Pat? He's the guy who sings, Voy a reír, voy a bailar, vivir mi vida, la, 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 la. Huh? That was good. All right, well, anyways, I, uh, you know, I'm get, getting sidetracked, <laughs> you know. All right, let's get out of here. <sighs> Look at that, changing up the, the uh, transitions, huh? Well, right now I'm at 163, uh, 111th Street, and this is a site of a church where something very exciting happened, uh, which is not a phrase you often hear. Now. Remember, this neighborhood was being neglected by the city. We're talking the 70s, 80s, and the late 60s. This group kind of came up here in Spanish Harlem known as the Young Lords. They modeled themselves after the Black Panthers, where they wore fatigues. Uh, they were all early, in the early 20s, they were kids. 
And they were basically trying to take this kind of sense of agency and, and uh, initiative and trying to clean up and bring attention to the neglect of the city to the neighborhood. And it was at this church where on December 28th, 1969, they basically took over the church. They occupied it. They had been kind of pushing the church to do more for the community, set up free breakfasts, all these kinds of things, and the church didn't want to do it. The church was more concerned with the propriety of protests rather than addressing the actual issues that the city uh, was kind of allowing to take place here in the neighborhood. So they took over the church and for 10 days, they basically had this church down. Police came and eventually, peacefully, it was stopped. But it brought national attention uh, to this neighborhood and to the city's neglect of neighborhoods like this. And we've all been sitting in mass and thought to ourselves, hey, we should take over this entire church and invite all our friends here and end this mass. Well, they actually did it, but they did it for a good reason. And they did it because they wanted to basically circumvent all the barriers that were in the way of them actually changing the neighborhood for the better. The occupation of this church actually helped recruit a lot of hundreds of new members. And at its peak, the Young Lords had almost 3,000 people uh, as a part of it. But it did help to kind of change the conversation a little bit. Uh, it's pretty impressive. These kids were like in their early 20s. The oldest member was like 25 years old, man. When I was in my early 20s, I was busy making, you know, beer can pyramids. And these kids were actually trying to change their neighborhoods. Pretty impressive. Now, the Young Lords were actually started in Chicago by a man named Chacha Jimenez, by the way, which sounds like a, <laughs> that sounds like a TV detective name, but he was actually a gang member who steered his gang, the Young Lords, more to the political side, the peaceful activism side, and then it eventually launched a chapter here in Spanish Harlem. And it only lasted a few years, uh, but in all that time, it actually motivated and also influenced tons and tons of actors. In fact, Juan Gonzalez, the, one of the uh, correspondents and anchors on Democracy Now! was one of the founding members of the Young Lords. And in only a few years, it did a lot of good and a lot of change and brought a lot of attention to the problems of neighborhoods like this. Also with other offensives in the neighborhood, they called the garbage offensive. The, the sanitation services in this neighborhood were also neglected, so they basically started putting trash in the streets to the point where it disrupted the city's functioning so that it eventually drew attention to how much they were being neglected. It got changed. They also occupied a hospital. They did all kinds of different things, but it's impressive. It's an important lesson that in neighborhoods like this, where they are neglected by the city, they often have to take these kinds of drastic measures because they have no other choice, and they're effective, and it's important. When, you know, when you're being neglected and different things aren't, going your way, there are still things you can do in a peaceful way as well. And they brought dignity and agency and a sense of control back to the neighborhood that desperately needed it. It's the Young Lords, really cool story. Uh, you should, should check out more about it. But this is the actual first Spanish United Methodist Church uh, where, where it all kind of went down. Uh, and, you know, pretty cool. Art. So we're at 106th and Park here. Uh, yeah, that's right, just like the, the old TV show. But uh, this is the site of the Graffiti Hall of Fame. This is actually basically like a living museum of graffiti. Uh, not like a museum where people are walking around, you know, with black turtlenecks and big glasses laughing like this. <laughs> but like a museum where you can actually come and see once a year, this turns over and there are different pieces created and everything. It's actually overseen by a group called Tats Crew, which dates back to the early 80s in the Bronx. They, they graffitied on subway cars and all that stuff, became very popular, and they do stuff all over the city. And there are beautiful murals inside. Here's the catch. There's actually a, a school here. At, uh, so don't, don't come here and walk around a recess and be a creep, but uh, there are times when it's open to the public and you can come in and see it. But uh, you know, it's pr pretty much a living gallery, which is pretty amazing. You have a lot of these kinds of murals around the area. Because keep in mind, back in like the early 80s, late 70s, you know, there wasn't a, a lot of outlets for the youth and things like that to express themselves. So graffiti was kind of a natural progression. And this one was actually started by a man named Ray Rodriguez, AKA Stingray, who was actually a, a street artist. And he kind of just made this a thing. And now it's, it's here, Graffiti Hall of Fame. And you have other murals like the, the Spirit of East Harlem, which is right nearby uh, by a man named Hank Prussing. This was made in the early 70s and it's been kept up. Uh, by his former apprentice, and it's still there, and it's got pictures of all these different people from the neighborhood at that time, bodega owners, local characters, and all that stuff, still up there. Uh, so you, you, know, you could be walking down the street and be like, hey, look at that, that's my bodega owner over there. He's the guy who makes my bacon, egg, and cheese. Um, and it's still there, up, kept up well. Uh, but, you know, one of the nice things about the neighborhood, you know? Graffiti Hall of Fame. All right. Great.
So now I'm at Fifth Avenue between 104th and 105th, and this is El Museo del Barrio. That's right, no, thank you very much. But this is actually a museum that was established in 1969 originally by a man named uh, Rafael uh, Montañez Ortiz. He was actually charged with coming up with a curriculum to teach the history of the Puerto Rican and the Latin American and Caribbean uh, culture in public schools, and it actually eventually became a museum. Uh, he actually started in, a, in PS125 in a classroom and eventually evolved into an entire building. Pretty cool, actually, I was done. And yeah, I understand that there is a scaffolding covering the entire building. I tried to file a permit with the city to have them remove it just for this shoot, and they told me to beat it or get 10 million subs before they do it. So relax, here's some, some fancy CGI so you know what it looks like. There you go. Uh, now this today is part of Museum Mile, which is a giant stretch of some of the most important museums in the country, which to the elementary school version of myself is a spot on version of hell. Uh, but today it's pretty cool. You know, I've grown out of that, you know? You gotta, you gotta appreciate the museums. Um, so this is actually kind of towards the end of Museum Mile here uh, near the north end of Central Park. You can go in today and see all the different cultural exhibits and all those things uh, honoring Puerto Rico and the Caribbean and the Latin American culture. Pretty important thing to do. Uh, something I'm trying to do here as well. <laughs> I actually covered it in my uh, Museum Mile video, which you can watch. Pretty cool. Uh, you know, you got like the Met, you got the Guggenheim, the, you know, the, the frickin' Frick Museum down at the end. Uh, so lots of museums you can kind of enjoy here. And today it comprise, is comprised of eight, over 8,500 objects uh, covering 800 years of history, which is pretty amazing. Uh, a lot more history we're gonna cover today, but still pretty cool. And uh, yeah, anyways, um, that's a loud car. We gotta get out of here before we get run over. Okay, so the neighborhood in the late uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s kind of took a turn for the worse, unfortunately, uh, as did Harlem. I've talked about this in other videos as well. Neglected by the city, we talked about the young lords kind of fighting back against this. But also one of the big problems that came here was drugs. Yeah, drugs, specifically crack. The crack epidemic hit this neighborhood hard. I'm actually standing here at 127th and 2nd at the Crack is Whack Playground, which is the name of the playground, which is kind of cool. At the Quack, <laughs> the Quack is Rack. Crack is Whack mural by uh, Keith Haring. You guys know who Keith Haring is. He died at 32 years old, 1990 of AIDS. He was a big, uh, like, downtown uh, artist with, like, the Basquiat and that around that time. Uh, you guys may recognize his drawings, like the Radiant Baby. You've probably seen them on a, a T-shirt in Williamsburg, you know, and you probably thought, I could draw that, but you didn't, okay? But anyways, this guy became really famous, friends with Madonna, you know the whole thing. Anyways, he painted this in 1986 because his studio assistant, Benny, got addicted to crack. And he actually drove around this area and kind of frequented this area, so he thought he'd paint it somewhere where he would come, uh, come across it. He painted it one day, and when he was leaving, he was actually arrested by the police. Uh, but they saw the, the painting, and they're like, oh, that's pretty cool, so they ju he just made a deal. It actually got vandalized, and he had to redo it. And he didn't redo paintings very often, but for this one, he made an exception, and it's now retouched and touched up, kind of make it, uh, maintain it and stuff, which is uh, pretty nice. So there's the Crack is Whack mural. But it's important to keep that in mind that the, 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 I guess the crack epidemic hit this neighborhood hard and then the subsequent war on drugs, which by the way, uh, you know, you had Reagan kind of starting that, a couple of big laws passed, uh, started that whole war on drugs. You know the whole 500, I'm sorry, the 100 to one sentencing discrepancy between crack and cocaine. That was all thanks to Reagan and then Bush and then Clinton. And it's a good thing they started that war on drugs because today, because of that war on drugs, drugs are no longer a problem. Thanks, guys. In 1980, there were about 50,000 incarcerations for nonviolent drug offenses. By 1997, that had increased to 400,000. Just to give you an idea of what that did. Also in 1980, you had about 32% of drug arrests were white, then 38% black, then 29% Latino. By 1992, the discrepancy was 5% white, 50% black, and 44% Latino. That's just to give you an idea of the effects of these laws. It's not, it's not made up, baby. This is real stuff. So these things hit the neighborhood hard, fell into decline. Today, the neighborhood is picking up, but I've talked about this in other videos. You have to be vigilant because now that the neighborhood and New York City generally is being picked up and built up, you have real estate companies moving in and trying to capitalize on this. And a lot of the housing they build uh, doesn't really include enough uh, affordable housing. A lot of the businesses that are brought in raise the land value, the rents, et cetera, and it doesn't take care of the people who've been here 
for a very long time. So these kinds of policies have to be, uh, I guess, tailor-made to protect the, the populations that are here uh, today. So this is an important thing to keep in mind going forward because New York City's real estate is white hot, as they call it. Uh, and you gotta make sure you don't lose the character of the city in the process. And that's the story of the crack is whack mural and the neighborhood in the 70s, 80s, and even 90s. Uh, but things are changing, you know, I guess. Uh, but, you know, you conti we've continued kind of on in the, in the replacing the treatment with punishment, uh, I guess, thinking for drugs. But we'll see if maybe that can kind of change for the better pretty soon. Who knows? I don't know. That's not what this video is about. So uh, let's keep it moving. But cool, cool mural. Still here. All right. Look at that. Well, we uh, we covered a lot today, man. We covered uh, we covered Spanish Harlem, East Harlem. What a story, man. We covered the original, uh, you know, immigrants. We covered Native Americans. We covered, you know, the Puerto Ricans. We covered, you know, Graffiti Hall of Fame. We covered a ton. I don't need to recap all of it. You saw the video. You made it this far. And because you made it this far, what would I be if I didn't mention the Patreon? <laughs> Uh, huge help extras on there. There's always extras on there, so check it out. Also, like and subscribe. You made it this far. Come on, man. It's just a tiny little extra step there. I don't know, Pat. Did you learn something? I learned loads. You learned loads. That's what the kids say these days. You learn loads. All right. Well, not gonna just, but you know, make this longer than it needs to be. We did it. We gotta find our way back to the train. All right. I'm definitely rambling. So, <laughs> see you later. Sick. <laughs>